Well, welcome to Know Your Family History, Improve Your Health. My name is Michelle Snyder, and uh, today I'm going to be presenting with Sarah Von Schuch and Janine Lewis. And we're both, we're all genetic counselors from the Genetic and Rare Disease Information Center. And that's funded by the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, Office of Rare Disease Research, and also the National Human Genome Research Institute, both of which are at the National Institutes of Health. So today our presentation is going to be very interactive. So if you have any questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand. And we're also going to be using the clickers that you were given to answer questions throughout, and we'll see uh, the responses on the screen, how many of you picked each response. So we're going to get started today with a pretty easy question. Have you ever created a family tree? So use your clicker and press 1 for yes or 2 for no. I'll give you a few minutes. OK, did everyone get a chance to respond? Maybe a few more? OK, let's, everybody in? Here, let's see what our responses were. Well, look at that, 80%, yes, that's really great. So today we're going to be talking about how you can use your family history to help improve your health. We have another question here. How many chromosomes do we have? We're going to do a little basics of genetics first. So press 1 for 23, 2 for 46, 3 for 48, or 4 for 92. And, and as you go along, if you want to change your answer, just press the other um, answer and it'll override what you pressed before. Okay. Almost all in. Let's see what we got. 61% chose two. Now the correct answer is two. You're right. It's 46 chromosomes. Good job. So. Uh, humans have 46 chromosomes. Our DNA is packaged into chromosomes. Here on the left, you can see what the chromosomes look like when you look at a, um, under a microscope. And if we, on the right, then sort of order them all up and pair them up, we'll see from biggest to smallest, we have 23 pairs. Um, and one from each pair comes from our mother and one from our father. Really, a chromosome is just one long string of DNA. It's tightly packed together. So if we unwind that string of DNA, we'll see that a gene is just a segment uh, of DNA, and the genes provide our instructions for our traits. We have 20,000 genes in our genome. Here's another question for you. True or false, there are two versions for each gene. Ready? Let's see what we got. 50-50. This, this is a bit of a tricky question. The correct answer is actually false. We do have two copies in our cells of each gene, but there are more than two possible versions of a gene. And I like to think of it like flavors of a gene. Somebody might have chocolate and vanilla. Another person might have vanilla and strawberry. So each person only has two copies of a gene, but there are lots of copies, uh, potential copies available. And so um, some of our traits are determined entirely by genetics, things like our blood type. Uh, and the things that are genetic traits might be determined by one or more genes. And then there are other traits that are a combination of our genes, our environment, and our lifestyle, too. So for example, that would be height. So we know many genes play a role in height, but also things like your diet can really make a big difference in how tall you'll end up growing. We have another question here. Is it possible for two blue-eyed parents to have a child with brown eyes? Press 1 for yes or 2 for no. You guys are quick on this one. <laughs> okay, I think we're all in. Let's see what the answers are. Okay, most people chose yes. The correct answer is yes, you are right. It is possible because eye color is not a simple genetic trait. It's actually determined by multiple genes. So it's possible for two blue-eyed parents to have a child with brown eyes. So we know that we inherit physical traits from our parents and determine what we look like, but we also inherit traits that help determine our risk for medical conditions. 
So we know that as families, we share a lot in common. We share our genes, we share the environment that we live in, and we also share our lifestyle. So by noticing the patterns of disorders among families, our healthcare professionals can help determine our risk and also help us take steps to reduce our risk. Now, just because you have someone in your family with a condition doesn't necessarily mean you'll develop it. And the same, the opposite actually is true. If you don't have a family history of a condition, you still might be at risk. So now we're gonna actually do an interactive activity. So I need my volunteers to come up front and stand here in a line. So this activity is gonna be, um, help us understand risk for common diseases like type two diabetes. Now is this mic working? Can you still hear me? Okay. Okay, so what we're gonna represent here is a continuum based on your genetic risk. So people here on the far left, they have a high risk for type two diabetes because they have two or more close relatives who have diabetes. In the middle here, slide down a little bit there in the middle. You guys are gonna. Are we missing anyone? We have enough for everybody? We need one more person? Where is, is there one more? Can we have one more volunteer from over here? I think we're missing somebody. <laughs> somebody volunteered and then didn't come up. <laughs> okay, so and then in the medium risk, we have people who have uh, one close relative. And then here on the far end, we have people who are at low risk because they don't have any family history of type two diabetes. So now we're gonna see how your lifestyle that you choose um, influences, either raises or lower, lowers your risk. So everyone's going to choose a lifestyle from one of these cards. You can either have a positive lifestyle, a neutral lifestyle, or a negative lifestyle. Okay, so Roseanne, you're first. What is your, what did you choose? Positive. Positive lifestyle, so that's very good. So this is going to actually reduce her risk. She has a healthy diet and she's very active. So you're going to actually move down two spaces and stand right in between these two right here. So if you, she, her risk is lower. She's moving down the continuum. Okay, now it's your turn. What did you pick? Negative. Negative lifestyle. She's, <laughs> she does a lot of smoking and sitting on the couch. So your risk is actually increasing. So you're sort of moving in this direction. So she's already at high risk, and now her risk is even higher. Okay. Neutral. Neutral lifestyle. She has a balanced diet. She has moderate activity, so she's actually not going to change your risk. You're going to stay right where you are. Okay? You already picked. Negative lifestyle. <laughs> you have to have better habits, so you're going to move two spaces down. So now, now her risk, she's jumped over those two. Okay, now you're next. Positive lifestyle. Okay, let's slide down here, two spaces. Next. Negative lifestyle. Okay, so now you're going to also move two spaces here. Okay. Neutral. Neutral lifestyle. So you stay where you are. So again, you have that balanced diet and you, and you have moderate activity. So, oh, you did yours already? This is why we have the cards. Remember who picked. Positive, Positive lifestyle. Very good. good. You made good choices. No, this way, this way. You're lowering your risk. <laughs> yep, right there. Negative lifestyle. Okay, nope, this way. Two spaces here, yep. Okay. Neutral. Neutral, so you stay where you are. So you're at a low risk and you're still here at the low risk category. Neutral. Another neutral. One more. Positive. Positive lifestyle. So you're already in the low risk category and look, you've kind of moved all the way down there. Okay, so let's reform here. We're going to say you four are now in the low risk category. So slide this way just so you guys can see. And then you four here are in the medium risk category now, so sort of bunched together. And then you four now are at the high risk category. Okay, so now uh, we've seen a little bit how our lifestyle influences uh, our risk. Now we're actually gonna determine who ends up developing type two diabetes. So in this risk, you three are gonna either sit or kneel down. Okay, can you do that for me? Thank you. <laughs> now you two here, you're gonna either sit or kneel down on the floor. And then you are gonna sit down on the floor. Okay, so for those of you who are standing, unfortunately, I've got some bad news. You developed type 2 diabetes. <laughs> and you can see that most of the people who developed type 2 diabetes were in the high-risk category. 
but that there were some people from all risk categories. Even in the low risk, there was one person who developed it. And um, so who um, was, who was sitting and who had um, a negative lifestyle? Did anyone pick a negative lifestyle for those of you who are sitting? No. no. But in, if you had, there are some instances where someone might have a very negative lifestyle, but they still don't end up developing type 2 diabetes. And then for those who are standing, did anyone have a positive lifestyle? Roseanne, she did. So she, you know, she made good choices, but it's still, it wasn't enough to prevent her from developing type 2 diabetes. So we just have a few things here. So just so that you know here, this just sort of demonstration show, it's okay. Uh, your family history can be used to determine your risk for complex common diseases like diabetes, and your lifestyle can help make choices to either raise or lower your risk. So not everyone um, at high risk developed the condition. There was one person who didn't. Um, and I like to say low risk doesn't equal no risk. So you still do have a chance. It's just less of a chance than if you were in the higher risk categories. So thank you for all my volunteers. I really appreciate it. Oh, yes, here, take off your cards. Collect them. Yeah, just put it down, it's fine. Hi, I'm Sarah. So what, um, what might we expect to find when we do our family health history? Some of you may already know because many of you have already done one. But it wouldn't be a surprise if when you do your family health history you find conditions such as these. These are common disorders, things like heart disease, asthma, diabetes, cancer, kidney disease, autoimmune conditions. We also call these um, conditions complex. And just like our risk continuum activity demonstrated, we, um, we know that there are many factors that, that come to play in causing these conditions. So we know enough to know a little bit about risk. We know that for stroke, that diet, exercise, and behaviors like, like smoking are risk factors as well as our genetic information. But when it comes to, to really um, just explaining or understanding exactly how our genes are contributing to risk, um, it's a very difficult problem to solve. And there's a lot of bright people that do um, clever studies to, to sort this out. And if you follow the biomedical literature or even um, pay attention to the news, you, have, you often hear little bits about knowledge that we glean about exactly how our genetic information is contributing to these diseases. But when we're talking about, about family health history, what we hope to gain from doing it um, is to get a general sense of risk, low, medium, or high, for when we find a common complex disorder in our family. And one way we can do that is, um, one thing we've done in, uh, in our studies and observations is we recognize that there are some families that are at a particularly uh, increased risk based upon their, their genetic information. And so we can study those families, we can observe certain characteristics and use our knowledge of those families to help identify other families that may be at a similarly increased risk. So not thinking of you and I specifically, but collectively, what might we find if we do our family health history? So there's been a few studies that looked into this, and I want you guys to give me your best guess. So grab your clickers. Uh, how many people who complete a family health history have a moderately increased risk for a common condition? Is it 1, 50%, 2, 25%, 3, 5 to 15%, or 4, less than 5%? All right, let's see. So most people guessed 50%. In fact, so estimates uh, suggest that as high as three in 20 people who complete a family health history are identified as being at a moderate increased risk. So in three is the correct answer. All right, similar question, best guess. How many people who complete a family health history are found to be at a high risk for a common condition? Is it 1, 25%, 2, 15%, 3, 1 to 5%, or 4, less than 1%? You 
guys are much quicker this time. Oh, we're all over the place here. So uh, again, based on studies, it's estimated that about one in 20 people, um, or around uh, one to 5% um, who complete a family health history are identified as being at a high risk for a common condition. And by moderate risk, we're talking about a two to five fold increased risk. High risk, we're talking about up to 50 fold increased risk for a condition. So by doing nothing more than taking the time to collect information on your family, uh, a substantial amount of people are going to identify information about their family health history that they can now discuss with their doctors, that they can do research, explore more about what that may, might mean for them and their health. Okay, so we do a family health history. Unless we're lucky, we're probably going to find conditions like we saw on the slide, some common complex disorders. But what about genetic conditions? And of course, there's the argument that all conditions are genetic, but I'm talking about single gene disorders, things like cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease. So family health history for ages has been used by health professionals and by genetic professionals to assess specific risks, defined risks for families that have a history of, um, of genetic conditions. We, maybe we can refer these, to these as single gene disorders. So we, unlike com complex conditions, single gene conditions, we um, often understand, we, we may know the gene. These uh, single gene disorders often run in families in one of several specific patterns. So we can use our information of the genes, of, of our understanding of the cause, and understanding of the patterns to make specific, uh, more defined risk uh, estimate, estimates for family members. But of course, and you probably are all thinking this, single gene disorders are rare. So maybe, you know, if we do a family health history, you know, many of us are not, are possibly not going to find a single gene disorder in their family, but this isn't always the case. And some good examples, there's 2 million Americans, mostly African Americans, that are carriers or of uh, a mutation in a, a beta globin gene. We call them to be sickle cell trait, have sickle cell trait. Um, and you may ask why is that so common and why are so many people that are carriers have African ancestry and, and perhaps you've heard that um, the reason is having a, the trait actually per, confers some protection against death by malaria disease. And we also know that Africa has been hard hit by malarial disease. So you can imagine if you're, you know, if you're, if you are born with this trait and you are exposed to malaria and you become sick, if you have the trait, you're more likely to survive. So you're more likely to grow up. You're more likely to have your own um, children and every one of your children would have a one in two chance of inheriting that trait. And we can see that pattern again and again. And over a population and over amount of time, then you start that the, this trait becomes more prevalent. Of course, in the United States, you're not going to find out you're a sickle cell, uh, you, you have sickle cell trait because you survive malaria, but probably we, because perhaps you're tested or you have a family, health, a family history of sickle cell disease. We know that uh, one gene change in this beta globin gene can improve survival and is actually an advantage, but having two changes. Um, it can cause a um, condition called sickle cell disease, where uh, the sickled cells or the crescent-shaped cells can become tra uh, trapped in blood vessels that go to your limbs and organs and can actually cause significant um, pain and um, damage to the body. So this, when we're thinking about family health history, sickle cell dis uh, trait is a good reminder that when we're collecting our history to think also about our ancestry, about our um, ethnicity, because sharing that information with your doctor, um, we know that can may uh, lead to discussions about addi additional testing that you may be um, may be available to you, because we know that some single gene disorders are more common in people of certain ethnicities and races. Okay, so you guys may recognize this face. This is one of my favorite um, stay-at-home moms. This is Claire Dunphy from the popular television show Modern Family, and we're going to. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, how you go about collecting a family health history. And we're going to do a very simple family history using Claire. Um, we won't go into there. We, I hope to just glean some of some highlights and some um, things to think about as you're collecting your family health history. Um, but I want to point out that there are some wonderful resources that will go in much, you know, in, in great depth. And in fact, we have some pamphlets here today um, on our table that discusses. Um, 
uh, in depth some of the thoughts and, and things that might come up as you uh, think about approaching your relatives, about talking about their health, health history. Um, if you have relatives that, that aren't here today and you want to introduce them to the concept of family health history, these are great tools for doing that too. Um, you'll also know as we go along that I'm going to put Claire's uh, family health history in a classical format called a pedigree. We're not going to get hung up on how we do these, where to, to, to use circles and squares and lines and dashes because, uh, again, there's a great resource online that can do it all for you. So My Family Health Portrait is a website by the U.S. Surgeon General. You plug your family health history information in. Uh, you can choose to have that sent to a pedigree and it'll display it for you. You can print that and share that with your family and physician. And then a slightly different resource, this is just to highlight, there's a number of great resources out there where you, um, you this is a, this is Family Healthware and this was developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, the, what it does is it, it'll collect um, your family health history information, you answer a few little questions, and it's going to generate your risk for six common complex disorders, low, medium, high, and give you some concrete suggestions about how you might address that risk. Okay, so back to Claire. Who should Claire be thinking about? Well, she should be thinking about her first degree relatives, her children, parents, siblings. Unless Claire has a clone or identical twin, these are going to be the most genetically similar um, people on the planet to her. They share half of their genetic information with her. She's going to also want to be thinking about her second degree relatives, her grandparents, aunts and uncles, um, any half siblings, so Claire has a half brother, Joe, uh, nieces and nephews, so if you watch the show, you know she has a niece, Lily, uh, and this brings up a good point. So we, we know that Lily is adopted, and a lot of us find ourselves in a position where we may not know our, our um, biologic relatives, you know, health history, maybe we also are adopted. And, True, you can sometimes talk to your parents and learn a little bit, or you can uh, contact your adoption agency and learn a little bit. But what you can also do is, and, is you can use a family health history to, to collect information about some of those other factors that we know affect risk. So we know that in families, um, things like um, diet and uh, behaviors um, and environment, these are all factors that can affect risk, and these are things that she could document in her family as well. Um, I'm just going to mention cousins. Sometimes people, um, some, sometimes it's recommended to include cousins as well. Cousins are actually third degree relatives, so they share one eighth of their genetic information with you. But you can get a full, th like three generation uh, image or picture when you include cousins, so that can sometimes be helpful as well. Well, for the same reason about shared environment, and um, let's, th I want to throw all of our other favorite characters in here. So now what? What are some things that Claire needs to be thinking about when she's collecting her family health history? So she's going to want to be thinking about and asking about common, you know, complex disorders that may be in her family, like the ones we saw in the slide um, earlier. She's going to be watching for anyone in her, her family that may have been diagnosed at an early age. So for cancers, a lot of times that's younger than 50. Um, she's going to look for unusual presentations. So a relative that's had um, multiple cancers, or maybe bilateral, like for example, bilateral breast cancers, or unusual presentations like a, a male relative with breast cancer. She's um, going to be thinking, she's, she's going to want to document um, any um, cases of early death in her family. And also when we're thinking about common complex disorders and you, you know, recognize their relatives in your family with these conditions, think about is there any other risk factors in that person, you know, that that person has that might account for that disease. So if you're finding a relative that has high cholesterol but yet they exercise and they eat healthy, that's something to be watching for as well. Um, it's easy to forget uh, about pregnancy difficulties, but you would want to know if has anyone had trouble becoming pregnant or staying pregnant, any conditions diagnosed in newborns, infants, or children, and um, consanguinity, which is just a big word. It's a reminder to ask your mom and dad, ask your grandma and grandpa if they were in any way related. Were they um, first cousins, second cousins? Um, when we think about consanguinity, we're not so much thinking about risk for complex disorders, but we're thinking about risks to um, you know, future offspring. The thought is that we all we all carry some recessive gene mutations, but you don't we don't always know it. But if you had a, if you had a child with someone that carried the same recessive gene mutation, um, then you would your child your children would be at risk for developing um, that rare single gene disorder. And so, you, as you can imagine, if you share a relative, then it's more likely that you might share some of these uh, recessive gene um, mutations. So grab your clickers. Parents who are first cousins are roughly how many times more likely to have a child with a significant birth defect than parents who are 
unrelated. Is it one, more than 50 times? Two, 10 times? Three, five times? Or four, two times? Looks like we got most of our responses then. So um, for all of us, so for, for couples that are unrelated, the chance, the, the chance that you might have a baby with a significant birth defect is around 2%, so 2 in 100. If your first cousins, oop, let's see, we, our guess, this looks like our largest guess is 10 times and then also at 2 times. So if you guessed twice as likely, you are right. So some people find this kind of surprising. So if you are first cousins, um, your chance is about 4%, so about 4 in 100. Okay, here's another question for you. So I have no family history of breast cancer or ovarian cancer on my mother's side, so I'm at a low genetic risk for these cancers. True or false? See what we guessed. False. That's right. And do you guys know why? Well, that's because you have to consider also the father's side. Even though a, a particular condition might um, occur in one gender or sex, you have to that you can still inherit risk for that condition. Um, so, for example, if you had breast cancer, if um, for in, in the example of breast cancer, you have to consider both your mother and father's side of the family. Okay, so, so back to Claire. What are some of the, the information that she needs to be sure to document as she's doing her, her uh, family history? She wants to write the name of the condition. She wants to write the age that the condition was diagnosed, and this can be an estimate. Was it 50s or 80s? Um, the age, uh, if a rel relative has passed away, the age uh, at death. And you also want to um, be sure to include people that are healthy. So if you have an aunt that's lived 110, that's, that's helpful information as well. And as we discussed before, ethnicity or ancestry is also important to include. So where should Claire start? All of this in mind, what might she uh, be thinking about? Well, a great place to start is just to ask yourself, if you think about your family, is there something that comes to mind that you're already concerned about? Maybe you think there's, there seems to be a lot of you know, this in my family, or I, maybe you have a relative close or distant that's been diagnosed with something particularly challenging and you're worried that you, know, you wonder about your and your family members' risk. So if Claire would start here, and if you were watching season four last year, around this time, around Valentine's Day, Claire was Claire and uh, Claire was had this evening of um, fun uh, planned, but she kept having these um, dizzy spells, and by the end of the evening, she passes out, and they t she ends up in the hospital, and she's diagnosed with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. So prior to this day, Claire probably had never given much thought to this condition. She learns that it's a heart disorder. Um, now, when she's thinking about her family health history. She decides to ask other relatives, and she learns that her mother, in fact, actually has this as well. And so what does Claire do with this information? How does she make sense of her family health history? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Janine. Okay. How's everybody doing? All right, well, let's see. Now, Claire has collected this amazing family tree. She's got some really good information. And, um, so now what? What do you do with all that information? So one thing that's come up for Claire is that uh, there is a condition, Wolf Parkinson White. She probably doesn't know very much about that. So probably her family members don't know much about that. It's probably one of those conditions that nobody's ever heard of. So where would Claire go to look for some information about Wolf Parkinson White syndrome? Well, the good news is there's a lot, it's a lot easier to find good health information, uh, thanks to the internet. Of course, there's also, um, it's not too hard to find bad information as well. So um, one place to start that we know is, is trustworthy is Medline Plus. And I don't know if everybody's been to Medline Plus or familiar with Medline Plus, but it is a tremendous resource for information about health conditions, um, categorized in health topics, and also disease-specific uh, information. They have very cool videos and tools that you can really use to understand health conditions better. So um, Claire might want to go here first to look up information about Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Um, also, the institutes, the National Institutes of Health, are made up of 27 institutes and centers, and each one of those 
um, often are focused on a particular disease or a particular organ system. So um, if I were Claire, I probably would go to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute to see what information they have on this condition. And then advocacy organizations are also a great resource for learning more. Um, here's uh, the American Heart Association. I think I would check out that, as well as the Heart Rhythm Society. And probably after going through those resources, which is really just the tip of the iceberg, um, I will learn that um, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is a form of arrhythmia, or it's an irregular heartbeat. Um, it's caused by an abnormal electrical pathway that causes a dysfunction in the way the heart is beating, makes it beat faster uh, than it should, and that can put someone at risk for um, a uh, heart attack or sudden death. Um, most of the time, Wolf Parkinson White does not run in families. Most of the time, it just there's no um, concern about that. Um, but it can be associated with other conditions. So she would be um, evaluated by a cardiologist. They'd do a full cardiac workup for her. That might include an echocardiogram, an EKG, um, and maybe a, a monitor on her heart to see how her heart does over a period of time. And um, they might find something else going on that's contributing to the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. And um, if that's the case, and the fact that her mom also has Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, she may be, that, their family may be one of the few where Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is actually running in the family. And there is genetic testing when you fall in that category for some genes that contribute to Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. And if, they, uh, if Claire has testing, and she would probably be offered that by her doctor, and if they find a mutation in a gene associated with this condition, then they would have a better idea of how the condition might progress for her and her mom. And they would also have a better idea how to monitor her. And um, it would also give other family members um, the opportunity to have a genetic test for this condition if they happen to be at risk, um, we know that uh, it can run in a, in a dominant way, so it's caused by a single gene. So you usually in familial Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, you inherit it from one of your parents. So if there's someone who's at risk, um, even if they haven't had any symptoms, they could go and have a genetic test. And then they would have more information about, um, about whether they're going to develop this condition, their cardiologist would be involved, and then they would probably monitor things differently. So in this case, it's, a, it's really helpful, you know, to have your family history, to know that you might be at risk for a familial form of a condition, and um, to find out, you know, what you might learn, do to learn more about that. Ah, another test for you. So speaking of genetic testing, uh, here's one. Genetic testing can identify all potential genetic conditions. Test me for everything, Doc. What do you think? One is true, two is false. All right. Let's see. How do we do? Ah. Most people got that one right. <laughs> but, and genetic testing is available for lots of conditions. Uh, just not everything. And thanks to the Human Genome Project that finished in 2003 and some follow-up projects that um, through the National Institutes of Health, um, scientists have a lot of great tools that helps them find new genes that are associated with diseases. We're now up to about 5,000 um, genes that are known to contribute to disease, and um, that number is probably going to continue to grow and grow. So, you know, we've talked a lot about, um, we've talked about genetic conditions that are caused by single genes, um, and uh, we've also talked about conditions that are complex and that are um, related to multiple genes and, our, and how we live our life and what we eat and what we do can contribute to uh, better health. So. Some kind of interesting tools have, um, are developed now 
for one of them was the healthware, CDC healthware that Sarah mentioned earlier. There are some other tools that are also out there that you can plug in all this family history information that you have and, um, and as well as how you, you know, what, what you like to eat and, uh, you know, some, some uh, um, just how you live your life, that using this tool you can find out what your risk might be for type 2 diabetes. Here's another one uh, from the Washington University School of Medicine who um, takes all of that information and you can get more information about what your risk might be for um, a number of things, emphysema, heart disease, osteoporosis. And then the National Cancer Institute has a breast cancer risk tool that you can plug in this information. Typically this is used by um, doctors, healthcare providers but it is available and uh, they just suggest that you bring any result back and talk to your healthcare provider about what you learn. And so when you talk to your healthcare provider, um, they, you know, if you have a concern or that you use one of these tools and it looks like you may be at an increased risk for one of these conditions, um, you know, your healthcare provider can help you um, know if there's other tests that they might be able to do to further categorize your risk. Um, maybe there's more screening that you might want to do. If it's uh, something like osteoporosis that you have an increased risk for, you might have more bone scans or an x-ray. Um, maybe there are, you want to take a good look at your diet. Make sure you're including enough vitamin D if it's osteoporosis or green leafy ve vegetables, so lots of vitamin K. And almost on every list of what to do to stay healthy is getting lots of good exercise. for. Um, Osteoporosis, for example, you want to get weight-bearing exercise so you build up your bone mass and never smoke. <laughs> so um, other things just to know about. So there's a single gene in the family, uh, a genetic condition. Um, there are a number of genetic conditions that are tested for in every state. Uh, through whenever a baby is born, they are screened through newborn screening for a handful of genetic conditions and that the list is, is uh, growing. And um, so sometimes condi conditions that are in the family, check your newborn screen um, to see if that's already been tested for. And um, the uh, treatments, there are a lot of good treatments for common conditions, rare conditions, maybe not so much. Um, so get involved in research. If there aren't good treatment options, there are some places to go to find out what clinical studies are going on and um, how you might uh, get involved to understand a condition better and to help in the uh, development of new treatments. And finally, um, share the, all this information that you have with your family. Now, um, some families don't like to talk so much, and some families like to talk a lot. So every family's different, so you do what you can with what you got. And um, save your family history in a good place, in a safe place, so that you can go back to it. And you want to keep it up to date. You know, we always learn new things about how, we're, how, how our health is. Um, so we want to, you know, ask our families, maybe Thanksgiving, Valentine's Day. <laughs> Phone calls, you know, just check and see how everybody's doing and, and mark it down. It's important information. So that is the end of our formal presentation. I think we have some time for discussion. And, and if, if you guys want to come on up and we can field any questions you might have. We have 15 minutes or so. I also want to let you know um, that we have some good materials here on the table uh, that some of them that we, met, we mentioned. We have um, this resource sheet has a lot of the um, websites that we've mentioned in the talk. So if you want to grab one of those to see, to uh, take that home with you so you have that as a resource. And the other thing I want to let you know is um, we will all be upstairs at 3.30 uh, in the genome zone. And we will be available to talk to people one-on-one -on -one if you have questions. We also have other genetic counselors here who are from the Genetic and Rare Disease Information Center who will be at tables. So we can draw your family tree if you want us to. So you have that to take with you. And, um, and you can ask any questions that you have. So I'll open it up for any questions that people have. Um, this is a little bit of a curveball, but is 
there any disease that's been shown to be related to mitochondrial DNA? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. There are mitochondrial diseases. Uh, there's a great advocacy group that um, is all for advocacy, uh, mitochondrial diseases where you can learn a lot about different mitochondrial diseases. So. Well, that's a good point, and if um, that's you, actually something that. Question? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so you're saying that if it's, if you're at low risk yeah, you're and low you risk, have a healthy lifestyle mm -hmm. and you yeah. can still get the condition, sort of how is that possible? Is that what yeah. you're saying? Yeah. Well, I think that that is it. That is something of interest, and even um, so. So if that would happen to you or a relative, I mean, just not. There's there's certainly two elements to that. It's like the you know science there to figure it out what's going on. And then there's us where we are and saying, well, if my relative, if that's my relative's case, like, what does that mean for me? And that's absolutely something that your healthcare provider, if they were going to do a family health history, would be looking for relatives just like that. If you're having, if you have um, relatives that are diagnosed with a condition that have no other risk factors for it, that's one thing that they're looking for in assessing your own risk. And certainly, if that was you, as well. But in the context, but it, um, in sorting out. Certainly, any time a research study is done, I mean, there there's different criteria and things that they would be looking for. But and some families have then, in that case, genetics was playing more of a role mm -hmm. in developing that condition, whereas in others, you know, genetics may be playing less, and then your lifestyle is playing more of a role. Yeah. So it, it varies. It's, yeah, mm -hmm. or environment. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other? This is unrelated. You know, my my mother. possible environment or it, you always have to look at the tests too and what what is it that they're testing for and may, may there be might there be something unique in your family that isn't being captured by the tests that are there and so it's true I, I, I find it one thing that drew me to the but like to the genetics field of genetics or biomedical sciences the pace of discovery and I can tell you and um, you know if I had gotten a question seven years ago about a particular disease and I looked it up and tried to figure out what you know about risk factors and testing I would get one answer. I, I go back there today on that same condition and I do the same research and see what, what's out there. It's completely different. And this is for myself too. So I, I just, so when I'm thinking about my family history, I think about the conditions in my family and I don't, I don't close the book when, I'm, when I've done one assessment. I kind of keep it open. And I don't take, um, take that for, a, I don't take my knowledge um, for granted when people call in at the, the information center and ask me about risk because I always do a fresh search. Because if there's one thing I know, the information changes, the tests change. And they're learning more and more every day. It okay. goes very fast. Well, there's some reputable com uh, companies that one can get DNA tests with uh, and find out their predisposition to diseases. Um, there are. Oh, are there reputable com um, companies where you can go and have a genetic test? Right, a lot of this has been privatized in mm -hmm. 23andMe, the right. Genographic Project. Right. Uh, that FDA just said that they don't want to do that. Right. Exactly. For their uh, uh, saying they could bring back this type of information. Right. So, where do we get this right. information? If right. We get genetic well, and how do you make sense of what you get? And that's the challenge. So there are tests that offer um, that offer someone like that, this blanket screen. And actually, I think we'll see more of it in like 
um, there are some hospitals. Cedar Sinai now has an expanded newborn. I mean, um, screen that they can offer a couple prior to you know pre-conception counseling, hundred con conditions. You know, when I was in school five years ago, that was that was did not exist, right? So it kind of gets to, but you still have to. You, you um, the danger is taking uh, is, is is making sure you have a full understanding of what the information is that you're getting. Because if you don't know anything about genetics and they give you information, it, you ha like me living in the field, I can, I'm kind of skeptical because I see how information changes and our knowledge changes. And one minute we think this, 10 years later, it's, it's, the paradigm has shifted. And so I think part of it is, you could, yes, there are tests that, um, it's hard to predict how your result is gonna help you individually. Is it gonna confuse you? Is there information that your doctor can really use? And so it's not always even about what companies offer the best test. It's kind of what, uh, what information is available to you as a patient, consumer, to make sense of what you find. And, and making sure that, that there's um, systems in place that you don't misinterpret it because and, you might make different decisions. I mean, you, it may change how you, um, you know, you may, you may be assuming that your risk is much higher than it is given a test result or vice versa, that you're safe and, and yet you know, you're still and the other piece of that is this, this is very new. They're learning. Um, it's very early in the game in terms of determining genetic susceptibility based on your genetic makeup. So they're learning more and more. They're getting a lot more information about it, but it's still very, very new. So the question is, are the inf is the information that you're getting back really accurate? Is it really reliable? Is it something you can really say, yeah, I do have an increased risk? Because, you know, there, it depend, I, there are studies where you've gone to one company and then another company and another company and they tested you for the same disease and you get three different risks. So, you know, it's still early in the game. So I think that's, that's uh, in the future. It's probably going to be something that will be available um, to people. And, if, and the cost of doing those kinds of tests continue to go down. So uh, it used to be something you'd have to pay, you know, a Ferrari price tag for, and now it's more like, you know, um, a Nintendo. <laughs> um, so, and then, you know, it's probably going to be soon, you know, a pack of gum. <laughs> Maybe not that low. But, you know, so it, it, it's, it's just definitely coming. Um, I think it's a little early in the game at this point, which is why 23andMe, you know, FDA, you know, wanted to take, step back a bit, take a look and see, is this really getting, giving us reliable information? Um, I'm not, I don't know for sure how reliable your ancestry data is. I'd say it's, you know, I'd say you have to look at what the, they're telling you in the company's um, documentation and um, make that judgment yourself on how reliable it might be. Yeah. Any other questions? Burning. And of course, we will be available afterwards if you have one-on-one -on -one questions you'd rather ask um, at yes. around 3.30. Thank you for coming. And thank you for taking part with your clickers. Oh, clickers. oh give the clickers. Oh, we have a couple more questions oh, before yeah. you go. Yeah, if you want to. Before you turn in your clicker, gene therapy is available for and can cure many genetic disorders. What do you think? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Jump oh, the gun. 53% said false. All right. I think that is right. Their gene therapy is really new. Talk about new. And there are some diseases that can be um, gene therapy is used for, um, but it's only a handful at this point. Now let's see what else we have. This is my favorite question. Okay. And this, this is, is one near and dear question. to your heart, too. <laughs> this one is, uh, does having twins run in the family? Is it either no, or identical, but not fraternal twins, fraternal, but not identical twins, or both? And my husband is an identical twin, so I really need to know the answer to this, because I need to know whether we're going to have twins or not. I hope not. I had to do my research on this one, and I think almost everybody's responded. 
couple more. Punch them in. See what you said? Most people said no. A few people said both. The answer is actually three, fraternal, but not identical. So we know that uh, fraternal twins is caused by when a woman releases two eggs at, at the time of her um, uh, ovulation. So um, that can actually be uh, inherited. It's a genetic trait for releasing uh, multiple eggs. So it can run in families. Um, so it, and remember, it's coming, um, it's obviously expressed in women, but it can be inherited from both men and women. So it sometimes may appear to skip a generation if there was a father and then who had a daughter and then she had twins. So identical twins is caused by after conception when um, the embryo splits in two, and that's not thought to be inherited, although there might be some, uh, there are some families who do have a you know, slight risk, but right now they think that it's just really more of a chance. Um, to have that happen. So the jury is still a little bit out, but for now we are under the impression that it's fraternal but not identical twins. So phew, I'm safe. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm happy about that answer. Okay, I think that's it. Think that's it. And also just the, oh, yeah. here's just the slide that uh, lets you know that if you need more information, there's a lot of great booklets here, but um, if you want to order more for some reason, you think they're useful for uh, something that's coming up for you. I know some of you are classroom um, are in the classroom. These may be useful for you to, um, these are, these booklets, Oops, yeah. <laughs> a guide to family health history and a guide to genetics and health. These are both really informative and helpful and useful books. So. Yeah, and we also want to say in our um, handout here, too, we do have information about the center that we work for, the Genetic and Rare Disease Information Center. We call it GARD for short. Um, and we're all available uh, every you know, day. We can, you can call and ask us questions. You can write in. Um, yeah, and so we get give, stuck out there. Yeah, and we get uh, individual answers to every question that uh, comes in. So we're more than happy to help. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Don't it. Don't forget your clickers. Yes, hand in your clickers, too.